This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 2385, Frugality in Practice, Do-It-Yourself Home Maintenance by J.D. Roth of GetRichSlowly.org. And I'm your host and personal finance enthusiast, Diana Merriam. Thanks so much for joining today. I have another article that can help you optimize your finances, just like each and every day, rain or shine. So with that, let's get right to it as we optimize your life. Frugality in Practice, Do-It-Yourself Home Maintenance by J.D. Roth of GetRichSlowly.org. I hate plumbing. Whenever a faucet begins to leak or a drain clogs, my stomach sinks. I know it means hours of frustrating work. It's not that plumbing is difficult. It's just that I'm not well-versed in the ways of home improvement. Somehow, I miss that part of manhood training. Despite my apprehension, over 13 years of home ownership, I've made it a point to do as much repair work as I'm able. It has saved me a lot of money. And while I'm a ball of nerves going into a project, I get tremendous satisfaction when I finish something and know that I did the work with my own hands. Yesterday, we woke up to water on the floor of the upstairs bathroom. When we couldn't immediately locate the source of the leak, we debated calling a plumber. Because it was the weekend and because we're trying to save money, Chris and I decided to tackle the problem as a team. While she buried herself in the Reader's Digest complete do-it-yourself manual, I took the toilet apart. Ultimately, we diagnosed the likely culprit, corroded fasteners connecting the tank of the toilet to the bowl. We drove to the hardware store, picked up replacement parts, and then put Humpty Dumpty back together again. We were able to repair our toilet for $6.49 and an hour of time. Had we called in a plumber, it would have cost much more. This is how home repairs usually seem to play out for us. Some initial frustration, a eureka moment, a trip to the hardware store for a $10 to $20 part, and then a final repair. Here are some things we've learned when dealing with home repairs. Number one, don't panic. A zen-like state is important for repair work. I don't mean this in any mystical sense, but it's helpful to be calm and relaxed when doing this sort of thing. Rash actions can turn a small problem into a disaster. Number two, act quickly. Don't put off repairs. While you don't wanna charge blindly ahead, you do wanna take care of the problem as soon as possible. We once put off fixing a small leak in the roof. You can guess how that ended during a rainy winter. Number three, use a reference. Google is your friend. We found lots of answers on the internet. As I mentioned though, Chris and I find it convenient to have a book on hand. In 1994, we paid about 20 bucks for a copy of the Reader's Digest Complete Do-It-Yourself Manual. The book has literally saved us hundreds of dollars. Number four, work methodically. When you take something apart, neatly set the pieces someplace safe. Label them, if appropriate. Be orderly. Follow instructions. Measure twice, cut once. If you have a digital camera handy, take pictures of how things were assembled before you dismantle them. These sorts of careful steps make repair work run smoothly. Number five, don't make assumptions. Some of my most frustrating do-it-yourself experiences have come when I've made assumptions about a problem, only to be proven wrong. Here's an example from my days as a computer consultant. I once spent several hours trying to fix a software problem that had caused a printer to stop working. As it turned out, it wasn't a software problem at all. The power cord had gone bad. Boy, did I feel stupid. Don't assume things. Number six, pay attention. As you work, try to notice details. You can never tell what piece of information will be important. Are the electrical outlets you're replacing two-prong or three-prong? How big were the screws on that gizmo, anyhow? Number seven, be safe. Some tasks are dangerous. Electricity can kill you. So can a chainsaw. I have a friend who accidentally wired his outside power for 220 instead of 110. The first time he plugged in his Christmas lights, it was like the 4th of July. When one of our trees fell into the neighbor's yard, I had my first experience with a chainsaw. I learned quickly that even a small tree has a great deal of mass. And number eight, know when to call in an expert. 
Not everyone can fix every problem, of course. Some things do require a specialist, but there are many nuances around the home that can be solved with patience, research, and elbow grease. Don't be intimidated by replacing a light fixture or a garbage disposal, but call an electrician to replace the knob and tube wiring in your attic. Home improvement can be intimidating if you don't have much experience with it. But with time, you can develop the confidence and the basic skills necessary to perform many common household repairs. If you're interested in developing further competence, take classes from your local community college or attend seminars at a home improvement store. I've also learned a lot by shadowing contractors as they work on our home. I always ask permission first though. Some are happy to explain what they're doing, but others are nervous to have an observer. Next on my home repair agenda, diagnosing why the light in our guest room sometimes switches on, but mostly doesn't. You just listened to the post titled Frugality in Practice, Do-It-Yourself Home Maintenance by J.D. Roth of GetRichSlowly.org. DIY home maintenance has always intimidated me. When I first bought my house, I freaked out over any little thing that went wrong and called my friends and neighbors for help. Thank goodness I found my Midwestern gentleman who's also a Mr. Fix-It. I think my main problem is impatience and fear. I'm so afraid that I'm going to make something worse if I try to fix it myself. But I've also experienced how difficult it can be to try and pay for help. For example, I've had a few roof leaks I've needed to address and have been fascinated at the range of quotes and explanations I've received. One contractor wouldn't quote me a price. He kept asking me how much I was willing to pay. Another insisted he talk to the man of the house, despite me explaining multiple times that I'm the only owner of this house. A third quoted me $10,000 with an overly complex explanation as to all the work that needed to be done. Ultimately, I went with an elderly independent roofer who was highly recommended by a close friend. He took an hour to help me understand what all the other contractors were saying. He also proposed a temporary solution that cost me $200, but he estimated it would buy me five years before I needed a more elaborate and expensive fix. So far, so good. My strategy has been to just keep asking around, follow my instincts on what feels right, and always try to work with someone recommended by someone else I know and trust. But that brings us to the end for this episode. Thanks so much for listening all the way through, and I'll catch you tomorrow on our next episode, where your optimal life awaits.